A somewhat known fact about me, a 22-year-old trans woman who makes a small living in the Midwest reviewing adult Japanese media for a feminist lens, is that I really, really like FPS games, and particularly boomer shooters. They are, alongside Eroge, my favorite genre of gaming, so much so that I've seen multiple people surprised at the places I seem to turn up. A soundtracks for various mods like Blood, Death Wish, and Elementalism being the remixer for Civi Eleven's credits music, and a bunch of other things that escape my memory because the passage of time is cruel and unforgiving and the last five years have been kind of a blur. It's unfortunate then that FPS and anime almost never crossed over until recently, and nowadays you've got games like Neon White and Mullet and Mad Jack taking up the anime FPS mantle, but for a while in the 90s and 2000s we pretty much had to make do of Shoko and only vaguely anime inspired games like Fear. And look, I love those games, but Fear is more J-horror than anime despite the Akita influence, and Shoko's engine and game mechanics are held together by paper clips and deteriorating Pat Labor VHS tapes that were recorded over with episodes of Lane on PBS, taped on a 60 year old VCR that's one bad day away from causing a countywide power outage. Also, neither of those were made by Japanese developers, because most publishers and devs there were more interested in getting what the US and European studios were cranking out properly localized. This isn't to say there wasn't an interest in making tiles in a genre, dedicated fans are always planning and plotting stuff, and there's even a half dozen neat ones we didn't get here, like Maze Triple Nine by indie dev Tetsuji Usude. Still though, Japanese dev FPS games have been, arguably with a few exceptions depending on your qualifiers, mostly limited to experiments like the aforementioned Maze Triple Nine, very different first person games like the Might and Magic Free Engine sci fi dungeon crawler Starfire, or the shockingly great oddball like Tetsujin on the Freedio by Synergy, that artsy 3D FMV game studio? God, maybe I need to do another Freedio video. However, there's one game that many people seem to have forgotten, one title from the mid 2000s by a beloved Edoge developer who's just now getting their much deserved love outside of Japan, that managed to bridge this gap and do it with stride. A game that's equal parts boomer shooter, complex story driven visual novel, and a love letter to all things edgy and B movie. A game that's as fresh as it is charming, janky as it is emotionally moving, a game that has wiggled its way up to my top Edoge of all time list, even despite its apparent flaws. And that game is Gun Katana. Gun Katana Non-Human Killer, which is the best full title for a game I have ever seen, is the brainchild of Ueda Metuo and Maruki Bunge, the former and extremely multi-talented director, writer, scripter, and most notably illustrator who primarily works on horror VNs, and the latter primarily a writer of yaoi games and doujin who, soon after this, crafted an utterly adored Taisho-era romance VN for women, which for the record happens to be translated. These two, alongside a handful of other talented staff like the composer Otomo Kaze, various programmers, playtesters, and other artists, Artists, all came together under the experimental and gameplay-driven brand Black Psych, previously featured on this channel for creating the incredibly gay Yami no Koi shipping simulators and the poignant and resident gore screaming show, to produce a game that follows through on all of its promises. Those being to deliver a story-heavy and thematically faceted boomer shooter cross-visual novel, starring the rare female protagonist in the FPS genre, in a world drenched in the most 2000s aesthetics possible, with a healthy dose of B-movie cheese to keep things fun and lighthearted, while still giving due attention to the often serious subject matter at hand, such as questions of freedom, trauma, and living under oppression. And you know what? It delivers incredibly well. It is one of the most loving tributes to all of its inspirations that I've ever seen. This is an FPS where god mode canonically exists and dual wielding rocket launchers is a viable strategy, a VN that pulls from the framework of titles made for men and for women and weaves it into something memorable of universal appeal, an edoge that leverages its adult scenes and themes to elevate the story, and it's a cheesy horror schlock that runs through countless tropes in a way so loving that you can't help but smile and get hyped for everything that happens. And like the title says, you can have a gun and a katana at the same time, three years before I defined Cybermancy, and this game actually works for the most part. While I won't pretend that it's perfect, as it has some massive flaws and low points that we'll get into in due time, Gun Katana is still an incredible hidden classic that's been buried outside of Japan due to the impossibly high language barrier and no attempt at surmounting that far as I can see. Probably because because the Venn diagram between FPS fans and English-Japanese bilingual people interested in 18 plus games was the size of an ant for the longest time. But you know who that ant is? It's me, and nobody can stop me from shouting off the rooftops. So without further ado, let's crack this game open and see what hides underneath the surface of 2007's oft-forgotten Japanese boomer shooter cross ultimate game, cross visual novel, cross RPG, Gun Katana Non-Human Killer. 
Gun Katana takes place in modern day Japan, albeit with some major differences. In this world, humanity has long been waging a hidden war against the non humans, mysterious creatures with fiendish powers who threaten the safety of the world, blending into society without most even realizing. In order to combat the supposed threat, a secretive organization known as the Gate of Ishtar, or GOI, was established many moons ago, and working with them are the Slayers, specialized soldiers who kill non humans for a living. This is the story that the GOI tells, but it goes deeper than that as one particular slayer is forced to realize. Tokiwara Himena, a young woman who had her life ripped away from her when the Saints, the GOI's top squad, discovered that her adoptive mother was a non-human. They subsequently killed her parents in response, and once the Saints leader Justine notices that Himena seems to be abnormally strong-willed, they send her and her half-human brother Hyo off to the GOI's prison and slayer training camp, Hatebreed. After a long, gruesome, and torturous time there intended to indoctrinate Himena into seeing the supposed true form of her foes, she and Hyo are let free, her under the forcibly imposed condition that she become a free rank slayer. Often referred to derogatorily as slaves, FR slayers belong to a system that rewards killing and punishes dissidents from the GOI's goal of slaughtering all non-humans, with freedom from the lethal remote controlled nanomachines inside them only given to those who max the kill counter strapped to their necks, the ELS counter. After Himena and Hyo fail an infiltration mission in a remote high school where the high-ranked non-human Mukai was hiding, her body count being reset as punishment by Justine, it seems that all is lost. But perhaps their day of freedom could still come. The two are given another chance at a big reward by Suyama, their controlling GOI agent, on the mysterious Yumon Island, a small, supposedly deserted site known for its high population of non-humans. But things aren't quite what they seem, as the island turns out to be of utmost interest to everyone in the conflict. Fellow pairs of slayers such as the cruel Sakiyada and the timid Kudeha, the seven keepers of the GOI such as Justine, free Asians like the mysterious and charming Mishiba, and the non-humans themselves like the prideful Virgilius and Himena formal target, are all pursuing their own goals, with her caught in the crossfires. Just who will she end up siding with at the end of it all? What are the true goals of the Gate of Ishtar, and why are they so obsessed with this abandoned island? Who truly are the non-humans, and are they really the threats that humanity has branded them as? And what does it mean to be free in a system of murder and oppression? For Himena, there is only one path given to her truth. To kill, kill, and kill some more. To obtain freedom and find the truths laying underneath the surface of it all including some unsettling ones about herself. Gun Katana's story and setting are shamelessly, unabashedly, and gloriously edgy as hell in the best way possible. What starts out seeming like it could be a typical FPS filler plot with cardboard cutout villains and heroes, doubled down on with a text scroll at the start that reads like a good Doomwad read me, is instead the basis here for an intricately woven and thematically complex tale with fascinating, well-developed characters and a captivatingly dark setting. If I had to describe the world of Gun Katana simply, I'd say that it's kind of like every B-movie horror an FPS setting trope thrown into a blender. You have massive monsters, creepy women with psychic powers, evil zombies, superpowered humans, corrupt shadow organizations, eldritch abominations, private military soldiers, fantastical creatures, and yet it all manages to feel like a single cohesive low fantasy horror world with an impressive amount of planning, rather than a messy ad hoc mixture of random ideas. The world building here is one of the game's biggest strengths. It never feels like it's over or under explaining anything, instead divulging information on concepts often through natural conversation, or interesting prose, in a way that keeps you wondering about all the strings being pulled and the purpose of many things until the very end. Especially since much of that information is given to you by characters who are telling half-truths to suit their agenda, or because they just don't know any better. While I think the game quickly establishes that it's an every side is the baddies kind of story, given that both the key figures in the conflict, the Gate of Ishtar and the non-humans, commit a hell of a lot of unnecessarily brutal mass slaughters, none of it feels like a needlessly cruel or violent storytelling as they both have well-established reasons to despise each other's guts and do what they're doing. Maybe one side is much less reasonable than the other as we'll get into, but there was never any point I was rolling my eyes. And part of what helps to develop all the different aspects of the narrative in the world is the way the writing shifts constantly between the perspective of our protagonist, the perspective of other characters, and third-person prose. Some scenes exclusively follow the thoughts of Himena, developing her further and providing her own spin on events, while others impartially narrate what's happening, filling in blanks with backstory and drawing attention to specific elements. Out of all the games I've reviewed and played, 
I can't say I've seen that many that shift perspectives around as much as this one, and so seamlessly at that. It helps too that the writing itself was legitimately fantastic. There's a flair to it all that feels distinctly like Bungay has found her own style distinct from the other writers at Black Sight. If I had to describe her prose, I would say that it's direct but stylish. It's rarely dressed up in highly complex language, and it doesn't aim to be particularly poetic or profound, but instead it accurately describes the world while still enjoying leeway to make clever metaphors where helpful, and accurately describe the emotions and tensions at stake at any given time. Commendations are in order too for her ability to often weave adult content into the narrative seamlessly, it's something that these kinds of games often struggle with, especially ones as loaded with a variety of content as Gun Katana is. I'll talk more about this later, but suffice to say, I think the scenes with some exceptions generally hold up well and contribute to the plot in meaningful ways while still fulfilling other goals. The character writing also feels very natural, almost surprisingly so of how cartoonishly evil some of the cast can be. The character voices are strong and distinct with liberal uses of punctuation and clever mixtures of kana and kanji for effect, the monologuing is captivating and entertaining, and the interactions between each of the cast members feel realistic, but still often over the top for fun. Gun Katana can, very often, be a really funny game that knows well how wild all of this is, and gleefully indulges in it in such a way that it becomes possible to follow along with all the absurdities and have a blast doing so, such as the very gratuitous use of English terminology. You've probably noticed in the footage, but things like non-human, slave, hate breed, a lot of these plot critical terms, presumably because they are canonically made up by a multinational organization headed in Italy, are in Latin text rather than being new Japanese words or transliterated into katakana. I'm all here for it honestly, it doesn't affect the readability of the game and certainly gives terms a unique weight when crammed into a serving of Japanese text. The game does a good job defining them as well for people who don't know what the words mean in English, Though being a fluent English speaker certainly eliminates any subtlety they may have had. Like, non-human just feels like a slur by a malicious entity and not a real good term, and a prison camp made to breed hatred of them being named hate breed is quite possibly the most on-the-nose thing ever. The cast here involved in all these shenanigans is rather big, at a total of nearly 30 characters, though only a handful of these are constantly around. Some take a backseat for the most part, some only show up in specific routes, and yet they're all at least interesting with strong screen presences, tend to be well-developed, and sports strong chemistry of others that helps to reveal more about who they are and what they're striving for in this conflict. Of course, the most important of them all is, without a doubt, Himena, our protagonist, who, in a rare move for a game like this, is not only fully voiced but very often has standing sprites alongside other characters, which goes a huge way towards making her feel like a distinct entity rather than something to self-insert into. She's a loving, caring person if she likes you, but she's also a brash, hot-headed spitfire that rushes into things, has zero qualms about drawing a gun and or katana at someone, and very regularly enjoys solving conflicts through violence rather than talking if she gets tired of that. She is very much an anti-hero type of character just on how motivated she is by her own desire to break free from the system, often callously disregarding attempts at allyship by other people if she feels it's going to get in her way. It's also interesting how well developed she is in pretty much every way, particularly as it pertains to how she got to the point of having the appearance of a hardened badass. The game goes through a lot of trouble to explain why she can be fine with the killing of non-humans, openly shows trauma she struggles with, shows sensitive sides of her, and humanizes a lot of her actions and emotions through the prose while still confronting the consequences of them. Her specific combination of traits keeps her entertaining all the way through the game, and the many endings and complex root structure of the title serves to explore her and others as completely as possible, giving her a character arc that, once you've reached the true end, feels satisfying after a long journey accompanied by countless other friends and foes. Basically, she's the perfect protagonist for a world as edgy as this, and a game as driven by combat as this, and in a story as interested in exploring its characters and themes as this, occupying the exact middle spot in the female protag Venn diagram of cute scrunkly and terrifyingly hot killer that makes for peak storytelling. Always at her side is the half-human stepbrother Hyo, essentially the polar opposite of her despite having an equally huge capacity for destruction. He's cool, collected, and rarely says a word, instead preferring to keep quiet watch of a situation and only interfering when Himena's hot-headedness could provoke an unnecessary fight or if their safety is threatened, as he's pretty fiercely protective of her. It's not inaccurate to say the two form somewhat of a bronze and brains team, but there's more complexity since Himena is still a capable tactician and never really has any total dumbass moments, at least nothing that I felt was like that, and Hyo is very much able to beat the shit out of anyone he chooses to, almost significantly more so than Himena given he has literal superhuman powers. He's just way less interested in doing that than Himena is and finds his powers to be more a curse than a blessing. As a complete contrast and foil to these two, the two other free rank slayers will see by far the most of in the game are Sakiyada and Kureha, two fellow hate breed alumni who ended up as polar opposites of Himena and Hyo. The former is a scummy man who's happy to stay inside of the 
free rank system so long as he can keep living it big in exchange for killing, and the latter is a depressed and broken woman who believes that power rules the world, sticking by Sakiata's side in hopes of riding on his. These two are not only incredible thematic foils to the main duo, but fascinating individuals in their own right that serve as the iceberg of the game's thematic explorations, with Sakiata's goals within the free rank system contrasting with Himena's, and their dynamic and potential dissolutions of it serving as an example of abusive relationships and exploitative systems, and each of them on their own shines a light on flaws present in their counterparts. Outside of them, you also got memorable folk like the ever-lovable middle-aged shopkeep Masayoshi, and of course, Mishiba, a wise-cracking blonde himbo with more to him than it seems. Quite possibly my favorite character in the game besides Himena, in part thanks to the incredible vocal performance by the very underrated Ichijo Kazuya. <laughs> <laughs> his character is best summarized by the name of his theme, Mysterious Wanderer. He pops up all over the place in the game, always seeming to have some sort of intel related to the current situation, and always acting like sort of a guiding figure to Himena whether she knows it or not. A lot of his best moments are huge, huge spoilers, but suffice to say he's charming from the get-go, and the mystery surrounding him is captivating the whole way through. There's an impressively wide assortment of villains too, almost all of their own complex motivations and inter organizational strifes, from the many non-humans to the higher-ups of the Gate of Ishtar. It's hard to talk about the most notable from the former without getting into heavy spoilers, but from the latter, Justine is by far the stealer of the show. While she initially appears as cold, uncaring, and cruel, seeking only to complete the GOI's goals while having no sympathy for anyone below her in the world, she gets one hell of a character arc and, depending on the ending, is one of the most impossibly cool characters in any VN ever. And from the non-humans, I'd probably say that Anes is my favorite, even if I wish he got more character development than an egotistical sadomasochistic gay femboy that hates women. Not to say that isn't sufficient in its own right, because it's both hilarious, hot, and was enough to land him as number two in the game's character popularity poll, but there is a lot of unexplored potential to flesh him out. And really, most of the other non-humans for that matter, who besides the ones most utterly critical to the functioning of the plot, generally don't get a ton of development or backstory. Most of the exposition on them is focused on each individual's conflicts within the group and explaining why they, despite basically all of them hating each other, are still working together to wage war against parts of humanity. For what it's worth, I do think that exposition is pretty fascinating and satisfactory. It didn't take long for me to get invested in them not just as villains, but as actual characters fighting for what they think is right in a bloody and unnecessary conflict. I just wish we got more backstory and learned more about them outside of a couple solid scenes. This is all to say that despite some minor shortcomings here and there, Gun Katana's writing is in most regards fantastic, and Bungei and Metuo both deserve some serious applause for both being able to bring a setting like this to life with the effortlessness that it comes off as having, and for managing to create such a fascinating cast of diverse characters. I mean that in more than just a personality sense too, this is one of the very few Japanese developed VNs I've seen that strives hard to have a legitimately diverse cast. Not just East Asian and white European characters who do still make up most of the cast, but also a really damn well written black character of Ark. He's a legitimately good dude, stuck in the same conflict as everyone else, and much like Justine, has a fantastic character arc in some endings. While we're on the topic of relationships, I feel like it is important to note that Gun Katana is in no way what you call a dating sim, even though the game does take heavy influence in writing from Ultime games. There's no selectable romances, and choices you make during the game have zero effect on who Himena ends up with. There are a few loving scenes of other characters, sure, but Himena is ultimately most in the Hyo and stays faithful to him in 10 out of 11 roots. I realize this entire step-sibling romance thing is going to raise some eyebrows, and I certainly don't blame anyone if they're uncomfortable with that and choose not to play the game because of it. I understand a trope as being both enticing to people as a taboo love and a way for the author to signal two characters having a connection deeper than simply romantic partners. Does that check out by real-world logic? Of course not, but you don't need me to tell you something like that. It's fiction, and this particular trope is pretty popular everywhere if the sheer number of highly rated erotic novels on Amazon about it are anything to go by. So for a game that does ostensibly write on spicy erotica for marketing, I get why it's here, even if I do just personally wish they were just lovers. Their romantic dynamic is really, really well fleshed out, with as much entertaining bickering as there are tender, caring moments of affection. And I'm always a sucker for the trope of a calm one in the hothead, especially when it's a guy who's calm and sensitive to the woman emotional needs and not the other way around. While I can sing the praises of most of the game's writing quality all day, and I will later in the spoiler section where I don't have to dance carefully around the game's most interesting plot points, I also understand that a lot of people are probably watching this wondering where the boom shoot is. So let's talk about that gameplay structure and the boom shoot. 
Gun Katana's gameplay is best described as a weird matrimony of the level and enemy design of Wolfenstein 3D, the structure of Ace Combat Zero, the skill trees of System Shock 2, the dialogue segments of any given VN, and the sword slashing of Metal Gear Rising. If you were to tune out now, that would probably sound like the best game ever, so let me dash your hopes slightly by saying that everything here, while incredibly fun and in many ways interesting, is also massively flawed. The way everything is organized here is much, much different from your typical visual novel, with your path being decided not just for dialogue choices, though they do matter, but also for choosing which areas to go to and when. Some events can only be seen within specific frames of days, and missing one can make a difference as big as whether or not a character meets a terrible fate or survives, which in turn completely changes the story and sends you on a different path. Conceptually, I adore this way to structure a visual novel. Plot being decided by something more tangible than dialogue choices like a map makes the branching nature of the game feel much more covert than many other titles in the genre, and it makes the outcome of your first playthrough feel much more like a natural result of your decisions rather than just hitting the right flag. In practice, however, I have much more mixed feelings as there's no flowchart or hint system of any sort, and the decisions you have to make to reach a specific ending feel almost sadistically obtuse. And probably the most extreme and painful example is the one route that requires you to not go to an area on days 11 through 13, view an event and make a decision that feels completely unrelated to where the route goes, and then go to that area you've been ignoring four times on day 14, and then you'll be on that route for good. I don't think there's anything else that reaches quite that level of bad, but I also can't say I exactly think most of the other paths in the game, outside of a select few, have sensible unlock conditions that you'd be able to deduce. And Black Sykes seemed to know that, because the bonus item given out for buying this game from Softmap was a complete guide CD, which is unfortunately not included with any future releases, so I had to rely on good ol' at wiki for a user-made guide, which for the record is extremely well written, and I commend the offer that made this for having nigh infinite patience for Sierra Adventure game level bullshit. I normally try to play games as blind as possible for these videos, but I'm also not going to shy away from help if a game feels too convoluted to solve without it. And it sucks, because I think this is a really cool structure in concept, and I would have enjoyed piecing the paths to endings together myself where they're a flowchart or just less hostile design. Speaking of which, there's a total of 11 different endings to reach here, two of which I consider to be true ends, six of which are normal, and three of which are bad ends. While you don't need to see even half of them to finish the game, you really only need a couple scenes split across two or three to unlock the so-called true end, it's worth going through everything due to almost all of them expanding on the themes, the lore, the characters, and just being plainly entertaining. Every action you take during the day to reach these conclusions, with exception to combat, drains a portion of your max HP. Eventually reaching a point you'll be forced to rest, restore your HP, and time will march on. This doesn't affect your ability to explore much, after all you can save and reload if you find a place that has nothing to do on that day, but having some HP shaven off does matter in combat. Maybe. Let's finally talk about that boom shoot. Gun Katana's FPS segments are stuck somewhere between Wolfenstein 3D and Quake in terms of playability. Movement is restricted entirely to two axes with no jumping or crouching and only the rarest hint of slopes, but the environments themselves, I think, are rendered in polygonal 3D and not ray casting like Wolf 3D or Chasm, but I can really only describe the mixture as an anime version of Chasm the Rift. The gameplay is pretty unique and entertaining, though flawed in a lot of ways. You've got one weapon slot for each hand, which means at the start you'll be wielding a gun and a katana, as the title would imply, though there are some weapons of both varieties that initially need both hands freed in order to function. But through spending skill points in the skill tree, you can negate that requirement as well as unlock the ability to dual wield any two weapons and two katanas together, opening up the door for pretty much any combat preference imaginable, blowing up groups of dudes with dual rocket launchers, clearing out waves using precise SMGs, getting up in their faces with dual katanas, or even just the old reliable high power pistol with a sturdy sword, the game encourages you to screw around to your heart's content as a whole arsenal is easily accessible for the shop run by Himena's good pal Masayoshi. I love this guy, he's probably the best Osan in gaming accompanied by the world's cutest airhead, Haruka, though his armaments aren't the best in the whole game, and Haruka is... Well, we'll get back to her. Some stuff, ranging from weapons to inventory items like grenades and health that can be used for the number keys, can be found scattered around levels in classic boom shoot fashion, presumably from past slayers being killed by their enemies, a cool bit of environmental storytelling even if the game doesn't have graphics for dead humans. Actually, the game doesn't have graphics for dead anything because everything explodes into jibs when it dies, which is fucking awesome. Most of the real good stuff, though, is only available for meeting special requirements and doing side quests. Some of these can be as simple as killing X number of enemies to get a new sword, the katana, English, nothing we've used with katana, Japanese, while others can require completing side quests, ranging from stealing a sword from Justine, to discovering a hidden shop inside of a labyrinth run by a shady mega corporation, to trading a creepy old man in a shack tons of scrap. The last one takes 
forever to do, but is absolutely worth it to get the best SMG and map extension in the game. We'll talk more about those in a second. A majority of what you'll be fighting in the game are these guys. Spiders that launch attacks in an arc vaguely predictive of your movement, and whatever you would call these, I guess the flesh wall from the Doom 2 Master Levels cover? But they don't really do much except menacingly run towards you and occasionally shoot out an attack, so most combat in this game involves circle strafing around the impressively massive hordes of monsters, upwards of a thousand on a single map without any lag as far as I've experienced, and clearing a path forward through quick elimination. It's about as simple as it gets, but there's an inexplicable and visceral joy to how it all feels that's difficult to get right in an FPS game. Enemies are often bunched together, so a couple slashes of the katana or a well stream of SMG bullets can rack up a quick combo, or thrash as it's called here, which always, always feels good with that meaty hit sound stacking on top of itself. The gun sounds, the frash counter popping up on each death, the way sounds clip each other out, the audio-visual overload until it's all over and you get a moment of brief silence where killer music plays clearly before you get back to the slaying. It's fucking glorious in the way that only boomer shooters can be, and the satisfaction only gets better once you get knee-deep into that skill tree. A multi-shot function that gives your guns a chance of firing two bullets, skills that let you draw pentagrams or crosses with your sword to deal massive consistent damage, even skills nullifying weapon reload and sword gauge time so you spend less time not killing mutants human-like creatures that may or may not still have fully-fledged consciousness. It also helps that pretty much every variety of weapon here feels and functions differently. The pistols are slow but high damage, SMGs consume large amounts of ammo for high DPS, rocket launchers are slow but have huge splash damage, shotguns have little range but can wipe out a whole room in a single blast, and the katanas are something special. By holding the right mouse button, your camera is locked into place and you're able to perform gestures to cut anywhere on the screen. I'm not sure if there's much of a difference between a horizontal and a vertical slash, a small stab, and a large cut but it does feel damn good, and there's even a few skills that allow you to draw shapes on the screen for huge bursts of damage. Theoretically, at least. I'm honestly not sure how the game intends you to draw these well enough in the middle of combat for them to proc, so I ended up leaving it to fate if I got anything. It's a very cool idea on paper that feels great when it pops off at random, but the execution leaves something to be desired. That said, it does make me wonder if there's even some vague chance that Konami took inspiration from this for Metal Gear Rising, because the entire time I was playing, I couldn't help but think it felt similar to Blade Mode in that game. All these skills you unlock carry over between playthroughs, as, in order to support the sheer amount of endings and paths, Gun Katana has a very robust New Game Plus system, where besides retaining skills, you're given the max amount of money you've earned up to that point of starting cash, and can choose to take up to 10 previously found and non-disposable items with you. The stats of your partner characters also carry over, which is probably this game's least remarkable gimmick. Throughout almost the whole game, Himena will have Hyo at her side to provide support in various forms, and occasionally other characters will join in for a brief time with their own abilities. None are quite as useful as Hyo, but it is fun how they'll sometimes chime in if you get a good combo. Besides that, you'll probably only ever use a few of the abilities they offer since Himena is pretty self-sufficient, with the most standout being status effect resistance for the few times that ever comes up, I actually forgot that was a mechanic, restoring HP when near death, and providing a map! Wait, what? I know some of you boomer shooter fans watching this are absolute fiends for jank, so here's where this game starts showing its jank. The map system here is fine at best, and agonizingly useless at worst. And by default, all you get is this tiny mini-map, which does auto-map, but in such a way that it can make it seem like areas you've been to are new, and it won't show you enemies or exits. And a game where the goal of almost every mission is to defeat a precise number of enemies or locate an exit. Some of this can be sort of alleviated for the usage of map plugins, an absolute necessity if you don't want to spend a Entry trying to locate the 450th enemy in a huge map, but there isn't any way to deal with that exit problem that I'm aware of. Not even the secret ultimate plugin that enhances your mini map with every power in the game has that, and Hyo's full map doesn't even get the mercy of having plugin access. Honestly, the only utility the full map has to me is navigating the more maze like levels, and I really didn't realize it existed for most of my first playthrough. Part of that is because the game never tells you that using partner skills is bound to Z and X for the first and second partner, respectively, and the other part is because I curb stomped combat so hard that I didn't even read the descriptions of skills because I didn't need them. The most pressing issue of Gun Katana by far, though, is the static nature of the combat. And to illustrate my point about this better, I'm going to reference a game that suffers from these same issues conceptually and solves them in execution. 
fear. Now, you might be thinking, Emily, isn't it kind of unfair to compare the literal first ever 3D game this studio produced against a title made by a studio who did this for eight years at the time of Fear's release? And you'd be right, that would be horribly unfair in most cases, but my point isn't to say that Gun Katana needs fancy AI or a huge aesthetical upgrade of lighting effects that blew everyone in 2005 away and still blows me away almost 20 years later. Now, the former is functional enough here if a bit empty-headed, its singular goal being to chase after Himena, and I actually quite like how this game looks, even if I wish you could disable the filtering for chunky pixels. My point is that both of these titles have the same core issue, a lack of enemy variety. With Fear, this is something that Monolith was more than aware of, as the entire game is built around making combat interesting in ways other than having a large bestiary. Fear constantly throws you into different environments that force you to engage in different ways. Every combat situation has you taking cover, making pot shots using your weapons, and traversing the terrain uniquely. Every office corridor, shipping yard, warehouse, and evil lab has its own personality. They're dynamic, they're fluid, and the AI being as famously good as it is, is like a cherry on top. A very huge cherry, sure, but even when you're completely overpowering them and taking away their chances to be cool, the combat is still dynamic and satisfying, and what weapons you choose to take with you have an even further impact on how you engage. Gun Katana does have some of this. It's at least got the variety of weapons down, since as mentioned before, the arsenal is legitimately impressive for how many different methods of engagement it offers up. And the game could be built in such a way that specific weapons are better suited for specific situations, thus making changing your loadout dynamically a necessary part of the title, like, say, Armored Core. The DNA for it is all there, and some of it is even engaged with thanks to the sword and gun combat feeling totally distinct from another, which may make you occasionally want to change up what you're doing. But the level design here is about as complicated and varied as Wolfenstein 3D, just usually without the maze aspects. The only environmental hazards you're going to find here are gates that block off paths and a few maps, otherwise you're just running down identical looking hallways only separated by their size, how many dead ends are attached to them, and how many enemies are clumped together in one spot for fashion. <laughs> Your strategy doesn't ever need to change, except maybe when encountering bosses, who can require some more tact. Mostly circle strafing. Circle strafing is OP here because it has the good old thing of X and Y axis speed combine. Uh, but the only thing that's really dynamic about combat is you and your power level, which is consistently enough to keep things fun. Gun Katana has a remarkable feeling of power progression and scaling that makes you feel like you've earned becoming an unstoppable force of destruction by the end, and that is impressive given everything I've just said. But I also can't help but feel there's still plenty of unused potential here. The alternative to more complex and dynamic level design would have been to introduce more enemy types with more varied types of attacks, thus forcing you to mix and match engagement strategies, which the developers were 100% capable of, as the few times new enemies are used, they can actually change things up quite a bit. I can't help but wonder if the intent was to do this for more than one or two short story missions, since elemental mechanics tailored for specific enemies do exist. Rust for robotic enemies, acid for zombies, and heat for living creatures, but by the time you're fighting these other kinds of enemies on the odd boss map, you've already got access to the power bullets that tear through everything. Without having either a strategically varied roster like Doom or Unreal, or the environmental complexities of something like Fear, Gun Katana's combat is… I mean, it's still good, but the kind of good that always feels like it could be better. Like I've said this whole time, it's viscerally satisfying at its core, and I still think it's miles ahead of a lot of garbage turned out in the 90s, like Corridor 7 or fucking Forbes Corporate Warrior, I don't know. But there's always that sense that it's just one or two good big design decisions away from being truly fantastic. I would also like to mention that, while on the topic of jank, Gun Katana's engine is a bit messy. Let me preface this by saying that I, in no way, want to detract from Black Sykes' accomplishment at managing to take a 2D game engine and somehow strap a 3D polygonal boomer shooter onto it. I also don't want to draw attention away from the fact there's only two people credited the programming for this that I could find, and I can't imagine they had a lot of resources to work with. That said, it also has absolutely zero sense of verticality, even when it feels like it could benefit the level design. Collision detection can sometimes break and you can shoot through walls and it overall feels like it's lagging behind even the original Doom at points. Though I can't say how much of that is due to level design not taking advantage of its capabilities, and how much of that is due to a lack of features on purpose. Generally, I don't mind something like this, like I'm not gonna give Project Warlock flack because it's basically just Wolfenstein levels of complexity, but this is a case where I feel like the game actively could have benefited from more complexity. Again, it has to be stressed that the circumstances this engine exists under, an engine that was made in-house by a studio that had never done 3D before, 
is nothing short of impressive, and I'd even say some of the issues it has gives it soul. Is it not technically the best that you can sometimes kill enemies through walls that the projectiles literally disappear when they've hit their max range? Maybe, but you can tell the staff was passionate about trying to do something like the games they love, and that alone is commendable and the quirks make it interesting to talk about. Speaking of interesting things, Gun Katana's structure is unique not just from visual novels but also other FPS games. While there are some one and done levels in a traditional boom shoot sense, most of the game takes place in a couple of maps that are meant to be representations of specific areas in the game world, and revisiting them for story or side quests often gives a different objective than simply heading in to grind for cash. The abandoned buildings are the most common of these, and they're perfectly fine, they're just a series of hallways and rooms with nothing to interact with. The game doesn't even have keycard mechanics like most 90s FPS levels. It's teased early on of a level requiring you to find one, and they do exist in the story, which is fun, but they don't matter in the context of exploration. The other most common location you'll be visiting in the game is the GOI campgrounds which I think is usually a lot more fun. Most of the instances involve shooting hundreds of enemies and clearing a path through them, which always feels good, and the couple of early mid-game boss fights here are some of my favorites in the whole title, because you get this massive area of tons of buildings to maneuver around, take cover in, discover hidden treasures. It's like a Doom 2 city level, but good! And then there's the rescue mission midway through the game, and it's a Doom 2 city level, but worse. There's fences and debris placed everywhere to prevent you from easily getting around the place, so most of your time is going to be spent humming walls and looking at every corner in the map and hopes you can find the one open hallway or nook that leads to another mess of fences and debris that may eventually, possibly, get you to your objective, which is not marked on the map, not even after you physically spotted the thing and realized it's behind another goddamn fence. It feels nothing like any other mission in the game, and to make matters worse, failing it leads to a different path that you need to go on for 100% completion, which requires sitting around for over 10 minutes of real time as enemies flood at you to prevent idling like it's desert bus until you find a corner that breaks the AI and you can grind something on your phone. You might not even be able to skip this on New Game Plus, because the skip mission button, while a feature I commend Black Psych for including because it's half of what makes repeat playthroughs for new endings an enjoyable task, of course assumes that you've won because most missions give a standard game over on failure, so every path that needs failing requires you to sit this out. Thankfully, this is the only plot necessary mission I'd consider truly bad. The rest of them are both much better designed and tend to get unique maps. Traversing through an abandoned mine, making a stand against a relentless wave of soldiers, breaking into a high security facility, a lot of them are a blast and proof that the staff, or really the single map designer Akikaze Ochiba, can create maps that are both memorable set pieces and entertainingly designed within some huge constraints. It's legitimately cool stuff, and I think a lot of these are really neat. Everything I just said may make it sound like this game is hugely challenging, but it's honestly more tedious when it's bad than hard. While it starts out a little tough as you have no skills, a terrible inventory of items, and no armor, things become progressively easier once all that starts to change especially the armor. Himena is a pretty squishy character until you've put some good points into defense, especially once you factor in that exploration chips away at your max HP for a day, so having some sort of extra shield as soon as they unlock is a necessity, as in this game they act as a second health bar rather than a damage reducer. And the first couple tiers of them are, they're alright, they make things way easier but still shatter quickly if a sound that haunts my nightmares. <laughs> And then you get the fence screen too, and the game is almost never difficult again. The main reason for this is that armor self-repairs between combat encounters despite being an inventory item like grenades or medkits, so even if it drains to a single hit point remaining, it'll just come right back as long as you clear the mission, meaning you're free to take as many blows as you want so as long as you don't get completely wrecked, and those late game armors can take a huge beating. It's a bizarre design choice that I don't quite understand, and it trivializes a game that already becomes easy once you get some skill points and a dual wielding weapon proficiency. I guess I should throw out the disclaimer that my opinion, as with anything, is not an end all be all be taken for granted. I have seen people filtered out by the FPS segments, and I have also been playing these games since I was 3 years old and played Doom on Ultraviolence for fun. I just wish this game had a skill harder than normal because that and easy are your only options. Though I suppose this is all better than being overly hard, especially when the game is as long as it is. Bear in mind that when I say long, I mean long for a visual novel. I've seen people call Doom average length for an FPS and that takes maybe 5 hours to clear, and something like Unreal or Fear is lengthy at 8 to 10. That's an assessment I mostly agree with because after about that time there's like a switch flipping on in my brain that gets exhausted with that variety of pew pew unless it's totally masterful. The good news then is that Gun Katana is about a quarter FPS and three quarters visual novel in order to support the impressive 40 plus hours of content, very little of which is meaningless or padding. 
My playthrough ended up taking about 42 hours of recorded footage of an average reading speed, but adjusted for unrecorded grinding, starting new runs, incidents of my cat hitting the quit game key, and pausing to make sense of lore, it's probably more like 50. This is a title that very much earned its standard big Edoge release price tag of nearly 10k yen on launch, and is certainly worth the 4500 it costs digitally. Speaking of Edoge, let's finally talk about what Black Psych is famous for putting in all of their games, wild kinky shit. Gun Katana is, after all, still an 18 plus game like pretty much everything else I review, and it's a game that very much seems to enjoy the freedom granted by that. Like most of their games before and after it, such as the previously reviewed and very queer first and second Yami no Koe games, Gun Katana's got zero fears of portraying adult content that goes beyond the norms of loving cis hetero relations. And while there's unfortunately no explicit trans characters like in those titles and some of their other releases, there is plenty of gay content between both women and men, along with cute femboys, fudas, tentacles, BDSM, femdom, and a lot of non con of a side of Guru, as is typical for Black Psych. While very little of the content here personally appealed to me, as I am one of those weirdos who mostly likes well-written, loving, hetero vanilla or corruption in the darkness with little in-between, I do think the quality of writing is overall both very good from an eroticism standpoint and from a storytelling standpoint. The scenes often do both purposes well, building characters and establishing details about them in the midst of eloquently detailed prose that goes well with the CGs. Also, just to emphasize this, the fact there's actual content here for gay men and fujos in the form of one or two scenes is a serious rarity and absolutely fantastic to see. The era Hero scenes are also where Bungay's experience in crafting galley stories for women is most obvious, as her writing style feels distinctly different from a lot of Don Seemuke, aka media made for men. It is very uniquely written to channel what a woman would find attractive in the scenarios. There's a focus on the sensations from her point of view, on parts of her partner's body beyond specific zones, and on setting an atmosphere and mood in ways that I've personally found lacking in other games. This approach to dynamics and framing is especially apparent in the most sensual and romantic scenes, like those between Hyo and Himena. What makes their scene stand out to me is the fact that Hyo doesn't have anything between his legs due to torture that happened at Hatebreed, so the scenes focus pretty heavily on Himena's joys for both verbal and physical teasing in a gentle but playful way, and shows Hyo being genuinely, legitimately satisfied even without the use of anything below. It's honestly really cool! Trying to quantify the differences between how different genders write smut in a vacuum is kind of a futile and arbitrary effort, but I do think there's a marked difference between when an author is writing for men and when they're writing for women, with the this title mostly drawing from the latter's pull of tricks, with enough hints of the former to keep the male audience entertained and more than just visuals. It's a good combination and middle ground as someone who enjoys both, and one that definitely got me more interested in playing more Ultimate games. If there's anything that I can fault Gun Katana's adult content for, however, it's that it has a bad habit of showing when it only needs to tell. Some scenes, particularly some of the more brutal and non-consensual ones, feel like they're written in a way that calls to attention the horror a character is experiencing in a way that seems very hard to find erotic, but some some of the CGs are kind of in contrast with this and it feels weird. The portrayal of these things isn't a problem in and of itself, if it's not already obvious that I feel that way. I want authors to explore the darker parts of the human experience, and some of my favorite Edoge are all about using every aspect of the medium to convey strong feelings to the player that are otherwise near impossible to portray with just words. But there's sometimes a dissonance here between what's in the writing's intention and what's in the art's intention. It's generally not a problem, but I also don't want to completely brush past the fact that explicit content could be found triggering for some, even if I found it merely uncomfortable. Still though, I do really like the adult content of Gun Katana despite a couple of rough spots. It's capable of being sensual and appealing when it wants to be, and otherwise emotionally provocative and resonant, sometimes carefully using the scenes to help one better emphasize the traumas and struggles that characters go through. And part of what makes these good scenes so powerful is the artwork, and as one can expect from a game illustrated by Leira Meto, it is masterfully drawn. Gun Katana is flatly a gorgeous game. I've waxed poetic a couple times now on this channel about how much I adore Ueda Meto as an artist. I did it in both of the Yami no Koe videos, I did it in the Gore Screaming Show video, and I will continue to do so here and for all of eternity because there's few people in the entire Edoge industry whose style resonates with me as strongly as his does. By this point in his career, I think he'd pretty much entirely come into his own, and that can be seen in every aspect of the art, though what stands out to me the most is how good the coloring is, which I feel like I say a lot in these videos. The incredible amount of mood that the CG can convey merely through melancholic twilights, gloomy nights, and radiant daytime skies is amazing, and Metowo's sense for shading is seriously remarkable. It's all very vivid coloring, too. The whole game has an aesthetic that feels completely matched for the game's dark yet still often lighthearted tone. And much like how the writing uses lighter elements to enhance the dark setting and make it more impactful, the art, too, uses a whole rainbow of colors to make the mood more clear and evident. I'd say that on the whole, Gun Katana's aesthetics have a pretty mid-2000s anime feel to them. Outside of the coloring and 
shading. I think a lot of it's down to how the hair and faces are drawn. There's just something about them that gives off those mid Heisei era vibes, and though Metowell brings his own quirks to the table, that makes something that I'd consider timeless. Well, except maybe for the character designs, which are as 2000s as it gets, and I say that very lovingly. You got lovely edgy boys like Hyo and Virgilius with their primarily deep black emo aesthetics, Himeno with her battle outfit that's as girly and silly as it is absurdly fucking cool reflecting her personality, Asaki Yada with his whatever is happening here with his shoulders, and other things that are plainly rad and or gorgeous like Justine's uniform. Probably my favorite in the entire game. Besides her casual outfit, that is, a outfit so good that Himena even questions her straightness. Black Sykes games have never really been concerned of straying away from this level of edge and absurdity of their characters, see this CG from Extravaganza, but Gun Katana embraces it to a truly remarkable extent, and I 100% support that. I don't think there's a single design I actually dislike here with the exception of DP because annoying overweight character for speech quirk is a very, very overdone trope, and his art really doesn't do him any favors. Besides that though, I'm a big fan, and the standing sprites that go with each character are fantastic. The highly expressive poses combined with detailed and subtle or not so subtle expressions go a long way towards giving the kind of quick at a glance information about the emotions of a character that one expects from VNs, and each sprite fits the character's personalities. There's a world of difference between Justine's cold killing glare when she's upset, and he may not looking like she's about to chop your head off. And this probably goes without saying considering how much time I just spent praising the art, but all the CGs here are unbelievably good. Even very early on in his career, Metuo had a knack for making impactful key art, such as shown in Yami no Kobe 2 in 2002, which he'd pretty much mastered by the mid-2000s with releases like Gore Screaming Show, and that comes out in full force here. There's so many memorable moments thanks to their clever placement, and everything about the contents of them is so fucking good, from the posing, to the composition, to the framing. It makes for a remarkably stylish game, and I'd honestly rank some of these CGs up there as personal favorites alongside the end of Fate Stay Night's opening. It's also worth noting that, like most VNs or games with a large amount of VN content, this title is locked to a specific resolution. 800 by 600 here, as that's what all the assets are made for. Nowadays though, you can get around this easily for really any game by using a program called Magpie, setting it to your preferred algorithm, which I like anime 4K, and presto! It's scaling much better than the crap that graphics cards offer on their own. It's not close to a real remaster, but for working with what are nowadays low-res assets, it's a pretty respectable real-time scaling algorithm. Equally as good as the art here is the score, composed by Alton Okaze, who, after doing the score to Gore Screaming Show and stepping out for Black Sykes' next big title extravaganza, came back here with something that absolutely blows his last work out of the water. I enjoy the soundtrack to Gore Screaming Show a lot and still listen to it regularly, especially tunes like Peaceful Days and Requiem, but Gun Katana's not only got a much larger variety of tracks, but way more of them are enjoyable on their own and all are fantastic in the context of the game. And my personal favorites of the whole soundtrack are probably Justine's theme and one of the boss themes the diarist. The former is this perfect mixture of regal elegance, tragedy, and an atmosphere of imposition, perfectly embodying her character in every single path she can go down in the various routes. And the latter is just an absolute banger, a perfect mixture of EDM and metal that feels empowering as it does daunting with the pumping, constant bassline, deep dance music drums, and the gallant yet threatening distorted lead guitar that barely ever lets up, often accompanied by a harpsichord and choirs running in the background that's just, mwah, chef's kiss, peak FPS music. This is the kind of thing I'd make for a 2.5D boomer shooter if I got hired for one. Hell, even the map screen is a banger, it feels like something straight out of Ace Combat Zero. It's all very well implemented too, as expected from Mate the Will and Co's scripting talents. There's some 30 plus tracks used in the game, and there's never any point where it feels like one piece of music is doing all the heavy lifting. Everything is placed deliberately and with care, heightening moods and even being excluded if it benefits a scene. This is without mentioning the couple of opening and ending tracks composed by the legendary Denkare, a band that's put out a couple of solo albums but is mostly known for working on titles like this. But I think the opening, Raison de is pretty good, even if not one of their peak songs. Both of the heavy metal ED themes, Chain and Mugen no Nemori, are some of my favorites from them and regulars in my work and walking playlist. Just absolutely fantastic metal tunes in their own right and well worth a listen alongside their standalone album. <laughs>
I honestly can't say a bad thing about the soundtrack. It's just an incredible score in the context of the game and highly listenable outside of it. And the rest of the sound work is equally top notch. The sound effects are crisp, clean, and about as 2000s as you can get with the laser sight and bullet firing menu sounds. And the FPS segments feel fantastic thanks to the crunchy hit sounds, satisfying bullets, and powerful sword swings. Similarly, the voice acting here is stellar. I've already gushed about how much I love Mishiba's performance, but everyone else pulls their weight too, with a ton of talented and famous seiyu, at least relevant to the Edo gay space. Sakurai Harumi is Himena, Yokote Kumiko is Justine, Minami Hokuto is Mukai, Kakihara Tetsuya is Hyo, Ishimatsu Kiyomi is Kureha. It's a very, very good cast of seiyu that I think most fans of anime and Japanese games are bound to recognize at least one of us out of. Most likely Tetsuya because he plays Jean in Blaze Boo. I honestly think this great selection of VAs is half the reason why the game's characters are as strong as they are, because while Bungay's writing in and of itself is fantastic, the seiyus, in cooperation with that writing and the great art work, elevate them to a whole new level, making a whole crew of edgy misfits that's equal parts endearing and terrifying. Which brings me to finally discussing them in detail, along with much of the rest of this game's plot. I've done my best to brush around spoilers for this whole review up to this point, but it's hard to get much in depth about the story or story structure without talking about the lore and the many, many varying routes. So if you intend to play this game anytime soon and are sensitive to those things, then I would suggest skipping past the marked sections. But first, let's take a little break from all of this to thank all of you wonderful patrons, donators, and sponsors who make videos like these possible, and learn about some cool channels from this community that you might enjoy. Hello all once again for that time of the video, the time to give life updates, channel updates, shoutouts, and appreciate the patrons and all the other people that make content like this possible. For this time around, well, I'm getting closer and closer to moving into a bigger space with more people, which means that I've been prepping to move alongside working on these videos and doing music, and it also means that next month's video may be shorter than this one. Almost definitely will be. I overextended myself here doing a long video in addition to attending the con. It was a lot to take in. Though that was a ton of fun, thank you to everyone who said hi at Colossal. It was kind of unreal to get recognized, but it was awesome, and I got to pick up a lot of really, really neat stuff there. Other than that, I am very pleased to say that Patreon is now stably hovering around 1300 USD, and even with the government taking a cut out of that, since freelance taxes suck and I lose about 15-20% to every year, I am still living much better and happier than I was before, so thank you to everybody who makes that possible. I'm impossibly grateful for the chance to have stable living and to keep producing content like this, and I'm happy this level of income has given me the ability to focus on these videos. As someone still used to scraping by to make it, like I've said many times before, this is kind of surreal for me and hard to describe, but just thank you so much. In an effort to give back to the community that makes this possible, I'd like to continue from the last video in shouting out cool smaller channels from a Twitter post I made asking for creators to send me their work. If you'd like to be potentially featured in a future video, then please let me know of your existence there so I can peep what you're doing and maybe feature your work. The first channel I want to shout out is GST, someone who I've been watching for a very long time and it's frankly kind of a wonder I haven't mentioned them before here. They primarily focus on cataloging the careers of video game musicians for a series called Artist Feature and exploring game music of the past with GST and EXT Mix series. All of which is seriously fantastic stuff as a game music nerd. Each video feels like a little voyage for a tiny cut of game music history, be that an artist or single genre, and the smooth edits, great historical info and text and or voiceovers, and fantastic picks of music make these videos great not only if you're like me and love learning about game music, but also as amazing and varied playlists to stick in the background while studying or writing. If you got a chance, check him out. It's some seriously great stuff. The other channel I want to shout out is Pyramid Inu, who I first heard of thanks to YouTube randomly recommending their video on the mecha anime Dugrum, and man am I glad that happened because I adored it. It's a series I'd only vaguely heard about, and by the end, I and the two other people watching the video who'd never heard of the series were very much sold on it. Their style of script writing is relaxed yet engaging, their choices for subjects are always interesting, and their voiceovers are really, really nice to listen to. It seems like that video blew up fairly well, though the rest of their stuff has stayed mostly obscure which is a huge bummer. I've enjoyed what I've watched of all of their other works, and the fact they only have free case subs is a crime for the quality of each video. So if you're at all interested in general niche anime topics, politics of mecha shows, or just good video essays in general, I seriously recommend giving their work a watch and giving them some much deserved subs. With those channels hopefully set aside to check out after this, I'd like to take a moment to answer some Patreon Q&As, starting with... Habibi asks, Would you be interested in talking about VN controversies like the Kizo Auto plagiarism controversy, 2chan's 525 text leak, or maybe you could expand on the Saudi incident? 
I think I'd be interested in talking about these where they're relevant to games I'm covering. I don't really want to do standalone VN history videos without some sort of critical review coat of paint, but that isn't to say I don't want to cover them at all. The Saudi incident in particular I'd like to explore more, as the ramifications for it for the industry have been immense, and there's a lot I didn't say in the IIO video, and I have a lot of thoughts about Aox and all that stuff now, especially now that I've played more Eroge and know a bit more history. Fofu asks, would you ever consider reviewing analyzing story from a mobile game such as a singularity from Fake Grand Order? Blue Archive video eventually? I need to rep my girls Mika and Litsuki and Hoshino. I'd also really like to talk about Salem from FGO because it's pretty standalone and it's been way too long since I covered Cosmic Horror. Lee asks, I want to ask if she listens to any D&B artists? I tend to listen to mixes more of an artist, though I am a pretty huge fan of the Amiga mod tracker artist Hoffman. Ghost Moths asks, You mentioning Corpse Party in your doc, list of games to cover, is super interesting. Would a hypothetical discussion be more around its very first PC-98 iterations, pre-remake localization, and how it helped shape what is generally umbrellaed as RPG Maker horror as a whole in the 2000s and 10s, or more so a general overview of the series and its many strange facets? I think if I did a video on Corpse Party, I'd primarily be focusing on the very original PC-98 game and its legacy, with potential separate videos on other titles in the franchise. Not many people have talked about the contemporary 90s RPG Maker scene in English as far as I've seen, nor the sheer level of impact that OG Corpse Party has had, and that all I think would be interesting to talk about in depth. That's all there was for this month, but before we wrap this segment up, there's one more very special thing I'd like to shout out, and that is the sponsor of this video, Very OK Vinyl. If you've never heard of them before, they are a small company out of Ontario, Canada that sells records with the soundtracks to various games and VNs, like Sayono Uta and Milk Outside a Bag of Milk. While I've been hesitant to take on sponsors as I want to make sure there's something viewers might actually enjoy and are of good quality, I was super excited to work with these guys as I'd heard of them before thanks to their release of the soundtrack to Rusty, a classic PC-98 platformer with an incredible score, recorded on real PC-98 hardware. They sent me the vinyl release of that and Sayono Uta to check out for the sponsorship, and I was really impressed with the quality of what they're doing. The packaging is superb with fantastic printing quality and even extra goodies for some releases, like this obi strip for Sayano Uta and the advertising materials, really nice touches to look over while you listen to the records, which expectedly sound fantastic. These are some seriously great well-mastered releases by people who know what they're doing. So if you'd like to get a vinyl from either of these games or Anno Mutationum, Heart of the Woods, Necrosphere, or something from another brand they sell like Bloodborne, Bloom Into You, or Death Note, then head on over to veryokvinyl.com and check them out while supplies last, as some of these runs are very limited. And keep an eye out for future releases, as there's more to come, including some that tie into games that many of you have been requesting. And with that, we are almost all wrapped up here. Again, I want to thank you everyone who makes this kind of content possible for me to create, and if you're at all interested in helping me out financially in exchange for videos without censors, your name on the screen as all the cool people have been flying by here, access to the list of games to cover, channel updates, Q&A participation, and other cool things, then consider making a pledge on Patreon. There's no minimum amount needed for anything beyond what Patreon considers the minimum amount for your currency, so donate as little or as much as you want to. Every bit helps out in means a ton to me. There's also a Kofi and a PayPal.me for one-time donations, which again, helps out a ton and I greatly appreciate these. If you don't want to donate though, then that's totally cool too. Watching these videos, sharing them around, leaving likes and comments, subscribing, any sort of good engagement is a huge, huge help and this channel would not be where it is if not for that. Again, I'm just happy to see people enjoy this stuff. It takes a lot of work to make these every month, but seeing people say they started learning Japanese or got into this genre because of me is one of the most rewarding things ever. I love spreading the good gospel of Edoge. As always, thank you everyone for your continued support, from the patrons to the cool people at Very OK Vinyl to the commenters, and let's get back to the show. Also, I uh, put out a bunch of albums on Bandcamp, including one that has a bunch of tracks I haven't released before. It'd be really cool if you could check those out. Okay, thanks, bye! In what's seemingly become a trend for this channel, a full playthrough of Gun Katana is kind of difficult to summarize, as the story structure is meant to be very freeform. Lore, backstory, and character development between roots is meant to be unveiled in almost any order, as sometimes with it being repeated slightly differently across multiple endings in ways that both work to enlighten someone who's already heard it, and fill in those that haven't. That works fine when you're playing, especially because this game has a very 
robust skip red scenes feature, but when summarizing the story, you're gonna run into a lot of repetition or have to jump around the timeline constantly, neither of which would make for a very good video watching experience. But I also can't not speak on the plot since one, people including myself like listening to women info dump about things, and two, Gun Katana's themes seriously need some context to be discussed. So instead, I'm going to summarize the events of my first playthrough and path, Free Rink Slayer, and the following Europe and epilogue you get on New Game Plus, intermixed with lore from other routes where necessary. FR Slayer and Europe are what I'd personally consider the most interesting and sensible paths as a canon storyline, because while the other routes are very good, and I will speak on them in due time, a lot of them tend to end in very inconclusive ways that just feel like bad and normal ends meant to keep you playing. If our Slayer starts out like all the other routes as described in the plot synopsis, Himena fails an assassination mission at an all-girls high school, gets her kill counter reset by Justine, and takes on the job at Yumon Island to work her score back up, and shortly after arrival, meets with a couple familiar and unfamiliar faces, all of which are introduced fantastically. You got the wisecracking himbo Mishiba, the good old shopkeep Masayoshi, and unexpectedly to Himena, Kureyaha, her old acquaintance at Hatebreed, found left for dead in an abandoned building. The next week or so of in-game progress is pretty slow in terms of main plot, though we do get a handful more scenes developing Kureha as a character, learning to both despise and admire Sakiyada for being one of the most captivatingly horrendous people in a game ever, and an extremely substantial flashback explains the full story of Himena at Hatebreed. It's a good sequence, even if a bit too long to me, but it does establish pretty much all of her backstory and well at that. Himena is an orphan, adopted by a family who lost their child in the same car crash she lost her parents in, and lived a peaceful life alongside her stepbrother Hyo. It all seems so perfect until one fateful day, where the saints find out her adoptive mother is a non-human and slaughter her and her husband. While the soldiers initially intended on killing her and Hyo, Justine steps into the situation, senses something special about Himena, and commends her resilience in the face of death, sending her and Hyo off to Hatebreed, molding her into a soldier and using the latter for experiments. This is expectedly a horrible time, as Hyo is brutally mutilated and Himena is tortured into hating the non-humans, being assaulted by a group of them on a guard's watch and losing the last bit of innocence she had. The only shining light in all this is Himena's newfound companionship of Kureha, though this starts crumbling by the end as she becomes acquainted with Sakiyada and slowly becomes more obsessed with the idea that power rules this world, willing to give up almost anything to have it. After a long, grueling time there, they manage to barely escape a combat trial turned by a firefight, and Himena is congratulated by the staff secretly running the operation with a jab of nanomachines and a collar slapped onto her neck, signifying her status as a slave and free rank slayer. And so begins her days of killing to survive, bringing us back to the current era. As Kureha and Sakiyada's relationship gets progressively worse and earthquakes on the island suddenly start appearing more than one would expect, Himena gets to make acquaintances with the hot Vishonen spider boy Okta. That relationship, as they tend to do, very quickly progresses into full-out warfare, as him and his friend Hepta make the first steps towards wars by launching an all-out assault on the GOI camp. While the Slayers manage to defeat him, it seems the non-humans aren't the only ones prepping for war, as a vessel from the GOI arrives hosting a huge number of experienced Slayers from Saints, including Justine and her two right-hand men, Ark and DP. I've said as much before, but Ark is definitely one of my favorite human side characters in the game, just a legitimately great dude with tons of great characterization, even before he had effects from the GOI later in this route. A DP, though... He gets what's coming to him. Still though, all of this is a pretty surprising sight given that Himena was told this place was some unimportant island, but Justine doesn't see any reason to explain what's going on to a quote-unquote slave. More pressing than this is that Mishiba offers to take Himena out on a date in the middle of her and Justine bickering, and there's really no reason to ever refuse a himbo's kind blessings. This scene leads Himena to learn about the concept of something called the Second Ages, a supposed new breed of humans that Justine is a part of, as well as re-examine her violent biases against the non-humans instilled in her at Hatebreed. And we learn the name of the last living first generation non-human, Beatrice. This is the conversation that really made me fall in love with Mishiba, and it's the first one that really makes you start to question how much he knows and where his allegiances are, something which you can only really piece together through playing every route, though I think this path gives him the most development in a single go. After exploring the island some more and saving a couple of young half-humans from being savagely murdered by DP, and getting reprimanded by Justine and Suyama alike for questioning the morality of what they're doing, the group stumbles upon the frantic robot Blood Eleven, fighting him alongside Ark and DP. It's through this that we're introduced to his owner, and by extension, the first we see of the cave-dwelling non-humans. Ane is an extremely misogynistic femboy who promptly makes his escape from the scene, presumably to report to his lover Virgilius. They have a 
heartwarming romance, if Yandere Yaoi is heartwarming? I think it is. I think being willing to murder for your lover is heartwarming. At night on the same day they fight Onis, all hell really starts to break loose as the shopkeep's cute lovey-dovey assistant, Haruka, turns out to be Mukai in a shape-sifted disguise, murdering Masayoshi in cold blood before proceeding to wipe out a massive portion of the GOI camp, resurrecting them as zombies setting fire to their vessel and cornering Justine, taking revenge on her for the disgrace she experienced at the girls' high school. Himina and Hyo manage to save Justine in the nick of time, chopping one of Makai's arms off at the end of the last fuck you, and Ark escorts Justine to safety, though critically wounded with an eye and arm both missing. Her fate doesn't go unknown for too long as Mishiba reassures Himina and Hyo that she'll be alright and is later seen that night making a deal with Ark. In exchange for information on the gate of Ishtar to give to his employer, the Chinese corporation Buronji, Justine is given medical attention and fitted with the best gear they have to offer. A super-powered robot arm that can do Metal Gear Rising shit, and an artificial eye with zoom and thermal vision. It's time for Justine 2.0. She doesn't have to wait long to test this out on a fitting opponent, battling Himina that morning over her having killed DP moments earlier in a duel, offering to spare her from Suyama activating the killer nanomachines for betraying the GOI's will if she wins. Which she does, barely, and only with Hyo's help despite getting utterly polarized by Justine's cyborg arm, and Himina realizes that something about Justine's demeanor has changed for the better at the end of the fight. Thus, a new allyship begins as they make their way into the underground. While Himena, Hyo, and Justine make their way towards the non-human's main hideout. Ark gets separated from the group and stumbles onto Kureha, being threatened by Anis. Ark manages to chase him off, and though wounded, Kureha is found alive and taken back to his tent to tend to her, in what's probably one of the most emotionally powerful scenes in the game. We're going to return to this later when discussing her as a character, but for now, things are heating up even more down below. Virgilius relays the information about Himena's progress for the mines, which leads to more fighting amongst the group, much to the dismay of Beatrice, who seems to want nothing to do with any of this. Anes is especially upset by all of this and Virgilius' dedication to catering to the first generation, going as far as to get a bomb implanted inside her so Virgilius doesn't have to think about anyone but him anymore. Do other games have Yandere femboys like this? I'd really like to know. Justine and Himena manage to regroup, and if you're replaying this path on New Game Plus for the Europe end, finally meet face to face with Beatrice, who Himena and Hyo first saw in the alternate New Game Plus opening but exchanged few words with. She willingly presents herself to them, and while Justine is initially hostile, she steps down once Beatrice asks if the GOI intends to do the same to her as they did to Marianne, the only other living first generation. Learning that they'd been hiding this from her, despite her being one of the Seven Keepers, the highest rank in the organization, is what really plants the seeds of doubt in her mind about the GOI's intentions. And so, Beatrice leaves of a request to take care of Marianne, and putting Virgilius off their trail for just a bit longer. Though not too long, as Himna and Hyo soon encounter him and push him back. He runs off, and we learn where Mishiba had been all this time. He'd been searching for Beatrice to see her in some of her final moments, where we learn the two were star-crossed lovers. Future roots expand on this much, much more, but for the time being, she asks him to leave her and escape, with the wounded Virgilius taking her back to her room. Himena and Hyo once again find him, defeat him, and Beatrice uses the last of her life force to beckon Hyo over for one final pardon gift. Sensing that he's a half-human, she gives him her blood to heal his wounds as the island begins to crumble to nothingness and the group escapes back to Japan. On your first playthrough, the route pretty much ends here. Himena and Hyo celebrate his body being healed, say goodbye to all the cast and crew, and the end credits roll. But the real continuation comes when replaying this route and doing the newly unlocked prerequisites for Europe End, a whole free hour long epilogue. A fast forward an unspecified amount of time later, and Himena and Justine are seen working together to break into GOI headquarters in search of something, or more specifically, someone, incredibly important. This formerly unthinkable alliance came as a result of Himena being suddenly called over to Italy by Justine. Of without the GOI's permission, though definitely with their knowledge as they find they're being followed soon after they meet. After a bunch of car hopping, Justine, along with the now dating Kudeha and Ark, explains their decisions to betray the GOI in search of the truth about Marianne, and going as far as to enlist Himena's help in offering her a nanomachine neutralizing vaccine to ensure her safety and freedom. Though she takes the vaccine, she leaves her collar on, not wanting to take it off until she's truly found her freedom. Not the GOI's idea of it, but her own. And so, the gang bursts into the headquarters, a massive fucking evil church, and cuts back to the present time as they split off their own ways. Himena and Hyo make their way off to Marianne, only to find her completely brutalized and kept alive by a Fred, though at least alive enough for her to make a psychic connection with the two. And Justine goes to find a certain someone, her fiancé, the leader of the Seven Keepers, Christoph Thomas Chavanel, who might quite possibly have the most evil name I've ever heard, and with a fitting theme to back that up.
Both of these scenes combined pretty much explain all of the backstory surrounding both the non-humans and the GOI and their goals, which is something as follows. Some 300 years ago, during the 1700s, a couple of mad scientists became obsessed with the idea of obtaining godlike perfection and bringing forth the second advent, so they created, or perhaps found, something referred to as the Kami no Utsuwa, or Divine Vessel, which I'm presuming is a tangible object, but Utsuwa could be a trait or a single person, it could be the bones of Jesus Christ for all we know. The point is, people wanted gods, and the result was the first three non-humans being born, Jidiker, Beatrice, and Marianne, the three of whom, alongside one of the scientists, presumably the scrap man from earlier, one of his predecessors would soon be branded heretics by the general populace, once people were made aware of the fact that what are basically demigods now exist on Earth. Chased out of human civilization, Beatrice and Judica attempt to lead a peaceful life inside a secluded cave, conceiving kids to carry on their legacy. Though the peace doesn't last long, as an organization is soon established for the explicit purpose of eradicating the non-humans, the Gate of Ishtar, bringing with them soldiers known as Slayers. Judica is killed attempting to negotiate peace, Marianne is set up by a lover and captured by the GOI, leaving Beatrice as the only first generation who escapes persecution for a few centuries as things become progressively worse. While some other non-humans manage to escape from the war and integrate into society, hiding their race, most are systemically hunted down and exterminated, many by the saints. In the eyes of the GOI, and particularly the Seven Keepers who run it, the non-humans are failures to achieve godlike perfection, particularly those after the first generation or are half-blooded, who seem prone to turning into monsters or, as seen in the scene earlier when Himena stumbles into the twins when they're dying, turning into goo, for what Kristoff presumes is rejection by the Divine Vessel. Their goal, or so he claims, is to eradicate these failures of the past, find and create that perfection, and become as gods. Justine is expectedly incredibly outraged that all of this was hidden from her and shatters the hologram projector that Kristoff was using to taunt him, and Himena gives Marianne one final mercy by cutting her life support off, finally allowing her to rest and perhaps see Beatrice in the afterlife. It's not long after this that everyone escapes from the ruined headquarters thanks to the help of Mishiba, and they all go their separate ways, united by a single goal, to keep fighting the evil that is the Gate of Ishtar to achieve their freedom. Like I said before, this is the first path I got when playing the game, and I don't think I could have gotten something better. It is the most fleshed out of them all, with the best pacing, the best conclusion, and the best scenes in the game, all setting the stage for what the title will spend the rest of its whole duration exploring. In a world where individual freedom comes at the cost of oppression, where murder is the only way for many rejected from society to find freedom, and entire groups of people are denied their basic rights, what is freedom and who gets to define it? It's something that every character answers differently depending on what they know in your current path and their own personal convictions, which is where a lot of the interpersonal conflicts come from. Maybe the most interesting example of this, for how terrible a person he is, is Sakiada, Himina's polar opposite in almost every single way. A former Saints agent who was stacked for reckless slaughter and compromising a mission, he sees the freedom to kill aimlessly for rewards with no one to boss him around but himself as pretty much all he could ever want with life, and far more free than the kind of life one may otherwise get in this society. Something important to remember is said in the intro to the game. Those in hate breed are considered undesirable by society with no protections from the government. The GOI both creates the conditions for societal rejection and offers its own respite from them with the FR Slayer system, and for someone like Sakiata, the freedom to kill almost any non-human with impunity and get rewarded is pretty appealing. But Himena's not like that, she doesn't want to kill for profit or fun, she's only doing what's necessary for her to secure what the GOI calls freedom for her and her brother, and even that is difficult to deal with. Take the situation of the kids for instance. Himena couldn't bring herself to take their lives even if it would have majorly benefited her, and becomes outraged at Justine nonchalantly saying the killing of children and mothers is a necessity to prevent the war from continuing. Which, for the record, is right to be upset about, but it's also kind of hypocritical given that she's also committing mass slaughter, right? Himena justifies her actions by viewing those she kills as innately dangerous things, just as dangerous as the ones who assaulted her at Hatebreed. She holds onto that trauma and turns it into fuel to justify her and other slaughters under this system, so as long as the methods of doing so don't feel morally wrong to her, which is mostly down to how much fun someone is having with this. Himena sees slaughter as a necessity for her survival, while others like Sakiata view it just as much as pleasure, which leads Himena to wonder just what the practical differences there are between them. This is taken to the utmost extreme extent in the ending Non Tomorrow, where Justine dies shortly after Mukai's raid and Sakiata asserts control over what's left of the Saint's force, disgracing Ark for abusing Kudeha to ensure no resistance is possible. Not too long 
long after he asks the partner up of Himina, and if she accepts that alongside his demand for intercourse, she realizes how they're two sides of the same coin and gradually grows distant from Hyo and herself. She becomes used to the slaughter of innocents, even though she protected before, and the ultimate conclusion to this route is both of them being hunted down by Mishiba and his mysterious bodyguard, with him asking her moments before death, is this really your truth? It's a powerful scene on its own given the thematic context, and one that becomes stronger once you've played enough of the game to see just what it is that Himena is willing to kill. It's not a group of creatures of a couple good ones, so to speak, a mother and brother that Himena holds dear is different from all the others, but it's a whole ton of kids, parents, and people who have been persecuted their entire life, feeling as if they have no other choice but to fight back against their aggressors, and it's people who just want to live their lives. The non-humans are people who have been deemed undesirable by society, just like Himena, Sakiyada, Kudeha, and so on, but with the key difference that the GOI sees them as completely useless failures of God and humanity that must be removed from the world. Unlike the free rank slayers who are ejected from the world but forced to maintain the backbone of it, the non humans aren't even given the grace of having purpose in the world once their true form is discovered. All of the terrible things they do in the game are for a reason. It's because they're fighting a world that has rejected them on the basis of their existence and they're understandably resentful towards it, even if that resent leads them to repeat the same mistakes as seeing all of a group as evil and untrustworthy. It takes Himena stepping up and accepting the wishes of Beatrice, the only one who sees that war against all is pointless, to even have a chance at ending this cycle of war, killing not the fellow oppressed, but the oppressors, destroying everybody. It's through propaganda that said oppressors are able to hide these truths from people, and it's through meeting the non-humans, talking to them, and knowing people who are deeply connected with them, such as Mishiba, but it's clear how Himena's attempts at moralizing killing for freedom are just a few steps removed from those she hates, like Sakiata. The true extent of his cruelty, as well as the GOI's coldness, is shown in the Supreme Dead ending, wherein he opts not to buy his freedom with his maxed out cash from getting Beatrice, but rather to use the contract's ruling of whatever one desires to purchase Justine, as this is one of the endings where Makai's true form is revealed before she can even invade camp. The abhorrentness of Kristoff's willingness to sell his own 2B wife out as a sex slave leads to Ark resigning as soon as he's made aware, and the GOI doesn't take long before ordering a hit on Sakiata once enough times pass. This is really the true nature of this entire system. The GOI wants soldiers that can kill ruthlessly, without thinking, and happily do it all over again, because the hatred of the people they're killing should be second nature, perhaps even joyous. They want people who hate non-humans and will murder without thought, and those who think too hard about it are swiftly put back into line or traumatized in order to make them more willing to kill. I'm getting quite a bit ahead of myself here because I don't want to talk about all this thing yet, but there's a part in the expansion disc following Kudeha's account of her time in Hatebreed, where she remarks that the prison is the real world world, and those who believe otherwise are deluded. The real world is one ruled by power, and whoever has that power rules over others. And I don't think she's entirely wrong, because it's not like the real world doesn't have massive power imbalances, and it's not like Himena didn't do anything in her past life that didn't cause harm to others without realizing it. No matter how dressed up it is, no matter how much we're distanced from it, most any single action one takes in the modern world is in some way tied back to some form of harm. A country is built on imperialism, wealth built on slavery, even day-to-day -day products have ingredients and components made under the most miserable and sometimes deadly of conditions. What the world Himena lives in now does is undress all of those things and exaggerate them for effect. Every single action she takes is in some way coated in blood, blood that she spills with her own hands. Everything she does to survive comes at the clear cost of harming another being, and by the time she'll have achieved what's considered freedom by this system by killing enough, she's already done an unspeakable amount of harm. It's probably not unfair to say this whole thing is some sort of allegory for capitalism, the way it forces marginalized people to fight each other, and much like real world capitalism, it's not her fault she was thrust into a situation like this. While she is responsible for some of her actions, she's also not the one who had her family stolen from her, nanomachines injected into her, and a collar slapped around her neck before being told to participate in a heinous system or die escaping. It'd be cruel to blame all of her for this, because she didn't have a say in the matter. The ones at fault are the ones who have created these engines of perpetual suffering. I think this is what makes the game's other true endings so interesting to me. The Freedom End is kind of a pain to obtain, as it requires you see a number of different scenes, but there is a purpose to it. Some are arguments with Slayers, challenging her conviction about whether the GOI would really give someone free will or not, culminating in her having a nightmare about a daunting, impenetrable door to freedom. Others are about those mysterious second ages again, particularly a discussion where Justine says that Himena may possibly be one of them, backed up by a sudden near-death experience where she pulls back to life in combat and suddenly gains godlike immunity and reflexes. 
All of this culminates in her finally buying her freedom, but doing so cautiously, which turns out to be the right move as once she makes her way back to Hatebreed to present to the agents that trapped her in the first place, she realizes they intend to trap her and shoot Hyo dead and attacks in advance, eventually locking her back up after containing her, following another outburst of her IDBQD powers. Upon escaping again with the help of Mishiba, she grabs her collar and puts it on willingly, burns the whole camp down, and makes clear the final statement of the game. Freedom is fighting against what keeps us down reclaiming symbols of oppression as our symbols of power. Freedom is our right and we each bear the responsibility of what we decide to do with it and how we achieve it. And we can. Even inside of oppressive systems, we can stand up for ourselves, each other, and create a better world. There's something really cheesy and fun about Himena getting a literal god mode and using that to help her finally carve a path towards the freedom she so desired and doing so for others, and it feels really emotionally resonant too, especially combined with the more fleshed out and complete Europe end. In there, Himena gets to have her freedom and fight amongst her enemies turned comrades to, together, tear down one of the most brutal institutions in existence, helping to right the wrongs they were forced to commit, and ensure they can't be repeated again someday. It's a powerful, strong ending, and one that I think will resonate with pretty much anyone who's escaped systems and lives of abuse. Of course, there's lots of smaller messages and ideas running through this game to help empower this, exploring what it's like being somebody in these systems and what they do to someone in every way. If I were to cover all of them and divulge all my thoughts in every aspect of this game, this video would never get finished, but I do at least want to talk about what is, at this point a trademark of my channel, trauma, and particularly as it pertains to Kudeha. I've made it pretty clear at this point that she gets the short end of the stick for a lot of the game. Not really in a way that feels like Bungay and Methua are purposely antagonizing her in the writing, but rather because she's ended up in her own horrible slice of hell in the vague hopes that she can escape the same nightmare that every free rank is trapped in. Kuriha has a firm, strong conviction in one belief that power is what rules the world. Through power and forcing your way onto others, you can get pretty much anything and survive pretty much anywhere. She also believes she's too weak to ever have any on her own and despises Himena both for her strength of will and for always seeming to throw a wrench in her relationship to Sakiyada, who bounces between nominally protecting her while keeping her around as a plaything and discarding her the moment she's an inconvenience. It may also partly be because of that callousness that she sticks with him. Sakiyada views the world and everything in it as a playground. He gleefully embraces the chaos, and so pairing with him means one has no need to question the way of the world. It may destroy her from the inside, sure, but in her mind that's just how things have to be. And as we see very often with politics in real life, there's a comfort in sticking with what's pushed onto you by those with power, no matter how much it hurts you. You don't have to be worried by burdens of people being oppressed, of injustices everywhere. You get to turn a blind eye and perhaps even benefit from these things at times. It's often easier for people to buy into oppressive systems like Sakiyata does than it it is to rebel against them and question their logic like Himena does. It's a toxic, brutal relationship that can be hard to stomach. The game has a number of very, very explicit scenes that amount to him torturing and humiliating her, accepting it for no reason other than a vague hope she'll get to live another day. Because no matter how much it hurts her, no matter how much it destroys her, it's what keeps her alive and that's what matters most. She even goes as far as to destroy other relationships in her life to protect this. With exception to the year up end, she's at best begrudgingly thankful to Himena for help throughout the game and at worst, and it's usually the worst, outright cruel to her, blasting all of her self-hate and depression out towards him and not to cope with it. And while all of that would be captivating on its own, and it is, it's that scene with Ark that I brushed over earlier that really sells her as a character and makes all of that difficult content worth the read. While things seem to be as normal in the beginning, trying to check on her and ask if anywhere hurts, she keeps staying silent, responding to not a single word. Until suddenly, she asks if he doesn't want to do something, multiple times ignoring him asking where she's hurt, until she completely and utterly snaps and asks bluntly if he's not going to use her body. She starts yelling, ignoring all of Ark's interjections to counter these feelings, about how all she has valuable to her is her body and how he couldn't have saved her for any reason but desiring that, about how he's a liar for not being honest about it, about how this world runs only on fair exchanges and kindness can't exist, about how nobody understands her and the pain of going as far as to sell her body to survive, the pain of knowing that men only want her body and nothing else. She screams and shouts until she breaks down crying and slurring her speech before it all comes to a sudden, painful stop, and Ark can't do anything but ruminate on the system that caused all of this to happen. He says he'll leave her alone so she can relax, but she refuses, apologizing for the cruel things she said and asking him to stay by her side. And so he does, making her food, idly chatting with her, and before long the two find they have a lot in common and begin to bond. 
Everything about this scene is fucking incredible, but what I think I love the most is its willingness to show the more painful and bitter emotions that trauma leaves someone with. It's not just sadness and fear, but pure unbridled anger that can come out when things are different than you expect, even when they're different in a way that should be good. Everything that Kuriha says and feels is something that I've personally felt at some point in my journey to recovery, and seeing someone in fiction spit out all of that vile and disgust and pure hatred, and being seen as someone suffering rather than a cruel jaded person is really cathartic and it makes the kindness that comes after feel more real. Ark finds himself caring for her not just as another soldier stuck in this hell, but uniquely as a person suffering from some of the worst abuse imaginable and the explosion of her emotions shows him firsthand how much she needs that care. And it shows that it's not only okay to get this care, but that she's a hell of a lot stronger than she makes herself out to be if she could survive all of that. I think this scene is one of the most obviously Jose Muke in the whole game, with how precisely it deals with sexual trauma from a woman's perspective perspective, the way that Ark cares for her, and even how it shows his tender side and embarrassment about having said tender side. Just the way this game develops its characters is amazing, and the way it explores trauma feels so, so empathetic and validating for most of the runtime. And that doesn't go just for Kudeha, it goes for everyone else too, most particularly of note Himena. There's scenes of her locking up from PTSD when she's forced to kill people like was done to her family, and there's a particularly powerful and relatable scene where she wakes up crying about the time she spent in school at the start of the game, wishing she could have lived a normal life like that. It's clear that the both of them are dealing with a lot, and the system they're stuck in sees that as advantageous, even if not intentionally. Kureha's broken belief system makes her willing to stick by anyone and do anything that guarantees her safety and power, and Himena's traumas make her a good soldier because she'll kill anything that looks like what disgraced her without thinking twice about it. The only way that either of them are able to work through this is by being shown kindness, and or by being exposed to those that they fear, but in a safe environment. Kureha learns that there are safe places and safe people in the world that won't hurt her thinks arc, and Himena learns that her hatred is misplaced through holes in her logic being poked by the world and people around her. The person who makes her realize this the most is Mishiba, that himbo who's got a habit of popping out at just the right time. I've mentioned some major conversations at this point that hint towards him having more of a connection to the non-humans than he lets on, most notably the one where he directly questions the hypocrisy of Himena adoring her family yet hating other non-humans, never quite steering her towards taking sides but definitely wanting her to soften up. The main reason for this is quite clear at the end of Many Roots. He loves Beatrice and wants her to be happy, and has since they fell in love many years ago during his days as a mercenary, leading him to quit the work, now a mysterious wanderer on Ryumon Island with his companions at Budonji, as they're pretty neutral in this conflict. I think it's because of all that that he wants so desperately to be a guiding figure to Himena. They are both people suffering because of a system that considers those that they love to be subhuman, and they're both facing a future where they may never get to live a peaceful life with the one they love the most. The difference is, Himena can still grasp her future and change it. Mishiba can't, and he wants to save her from that because he really, truly cares about her just as a lot of people do. And so, all of this is why freedom is what you decide it is. It's not something decided by a system that convinces you nobody cares about you, and it's not something anyone else can define for you. Freedom is breaking your chains and reclaiming them as tools of power. It's about having the right to take a stand and taking ownership of what happens from there. And it's about standing up for your convictions and what you believe is right, informed about the world and the people who inhabit it. And for many people, it's learning to come together with those who are also marginalized, fighting a greater system of oppression together. Almost everything adds together to create that legitimately empowering and resonant message, and as someone who has gone on many, many times on videos about the necessity of crafting a better future, of moving past hatred, of caring for those around you, and of fighting on no matter what, I cannot express how much I love this conclusion. It's a game that says to smash the system and fight back, and I'm all fucking here for that. Before I wrap up this entire spoiler segment, there are some loose ends I need to address about this game. Namely the fact that, up to this point, I have been completely ignoring a certain route because it's by far the most confusing piece of content in this game. It has nothing to do with the rest of the themes, the characters, or even the story as a whole, likely being a bit of early content that got awkwardly stapled into the final work. Iris Maiden is this game's black sheep as it goes against practically everything else here. In some ways, that's good. It's the one route that actually subverts the whole structure of the game, seeing the cast united against fighting a single antagonist. Akana, a tiny little evil psychic who was raised in a lab as part of a hidden research project at a GOI's Japanese headquarters, who goes rogue soon after Himena discovers her. It's kind of a fun premise, and if this route were just some wacky B-movie shenanigans inside of the Gun Katana universe, I could probably get behind it as a fun breather before wrapping the title up. But 
But, well, all of the new characters here who are present nowhere else are pretty poorly written. Her father, Mabuchi, is a caricature of an evil mad scientist. Her other caretaker, Misaki, kind of just spends the whole route suffering with zero insider payoff, which makes it hard to read. And Kana, oh dear god, Kana, uh, extra content warning for child abuse, this is rough. She is the epitome of a kusogaki, a loud, obnoxious brat who whines whenever something doesn't go her way, only now she's given the powers to literally blow people to clouds of red mist, which is fun, through self-pleasuring, which is... I mean, I'm not opposed to the idea of some petite adult woman using psychic horny powers to blow things up that could be entertaining, I guess. I'm certainly not one to turn down schlock if my VHS collection is anything to go by. And there are many scenes involving her which are fun in a cheesy way, like her army of psychic siblings causing all the heads of Mukai's doll army to explode, bullying the shit of Anes, stuff like that, and Kana kicking around Blood Eleven are legitimately amusing. And once she entirely goes down the path of evil at the end of the route, it's entertaining to watch everyone scrambling to defeat her. But the thing is... Okay, so remember when I talked earlier about how Edoge, sometimes, depending on the game and the developer and publisher and writers and yada yada yada, has a problem with dissonance between the adult contents and the contents of the story, because it's a genre of sales predicated on what kind of adult content you can include? Kind of like how FPS games trying to have anti-war messages shoot themselves in the foot by making a simulation of war really fun? Most of the time I only find this worth pointing out beyond minor grumbling or trigger warning when it's something I could see as seriously triggering, or when a dissonance is so bad that it causes the story to feel kind of gross at parts. Gun Katana, for the few times outside of this route this is an issue, it's just like, eh, uh, it's, it's fine, better than a lot of other games, not great, but it's fine. But I cannot be so kind to Ari's and Maiden. Akana's backstory is that she's like this due to being born in a lab to an abusive father, and having her body experimented on with a lot of very non-consensual acts, now grown into somebody who doesn't know right from wrong and finds pleasure in the killing. It's just, I don't know how to describe this other than exploitative, to show her in such a light knowing that all of this happened to her, and knowing that all the things she's doing are because she was abused into being like this. I have had to rewrite this segment countless times in order to make sense of my feelings on the route, but I guess the best way I can put it is that it feels like it's using the abuse of a minor as a way to drum up sympathy, which is bad, for a character that's sexualized, which is even worse in this context, and it is just the pinnacle example of the Edoge issue of not thinking about how erotic content might conflict with the story being told. Poorly using child abuse for sympathy is something I've seen a lot in a variety of media. I don't want anyone to walk away thinking this is a common issue of this genre. Hell, I think it's the first time I've seen it in one of these games. But god damn does it feel particularly awful here. And I'm certain there's no intention to minimize abuse on part of the writers here, especially as segments discussing Kana's abuse don't have any erotic content to them, and it's always portrayed as morally reprehensible. As I've said before, Gun Katana is a pretty empathetic game towards other suffering, and I generally believe it handles the darker aspects of its story well. But that doesn't change the fact that this whole route leaves a bad taste in my mouth, and it would have been much better off had they not even tried to include that kind of backstory, because it just feels tactless and nasty. The weirdest part is that Connor herself never expresses the slightest hint of pain or sadness or discontent at what happened to her, not even the tiniest bit of empathy. She very gleefully indulges in the chaos and has a blast doing so, so the only place you ever hear about this is from Misaki, almost like she was slapped into the root last minute alongside Connor's backstory to balance out how absurd her and her mad scientist dad are. It's ironically because of this disjointed nature that the root barely holds itself together as readable, because it seems to have amnesia about her abuse every time Misaki's not around, which makes it vaguely readable until it's mentioned again and everything just feels horrible. Look, Arisa Maiden is just a total mess, and for as much as I love the rest of this game, I can't go without mentioning how bad this is. It's stuck between two worlds of wanting to be a goofy, thoughtless B-movie fun time and a serious drama about abuse, and those two do not go together well. They feel separated enough for the B-movie fun to still be sort of entertaining until the bad stuff comes back, but I couldn't shake off that weird feeling while reading nor writing about this. At the very least, it has basically nothing to do with the rest of the game, so it's sort of easy to shrug off if you aren't actively engaging with it. There is only a single scene in the whole thing that matters where Himena and Justine talk about Second Ages, and besides that, you can skip through all of it, and I would seriously advise doing so. There is no reason to read this. Thankfully, I'm a lot more positive towards the last bit of Gun Katana content to cover. The fan discs included with all releases after and including Special Collection 
includes free stories. One of them gives Kana some backstory, which, I mean, it does well. It makes me feel for her, especially seeing it from her perspective, which simultaneously makes her a more interesting character in the main game, while also making all of the content even fucking harder to stomach. It's also got a particularly bad CG that I really don't recommend looking up. Uh, Dead Dove, do not open, etc. Another one provides Kudeha's perspective on her time at Hatebreed, which, while generally treading too much familiar around for my taste, is overall still a good exploration of her character and her fall into hell, with the little bit of new content being particularly fantastic. However, it's the last one here that I really think steals the show and is up to par of some of the best moments in the original game. It follows just seen in some of her earliest days as a saint and her first encounter with Mishiba. It's here that we learn just how deeply ingrained the bias against non-humans is with her, and again, how a good conversation with a good person can do a lot to change one's hatred, as she walks away realizing that perhaps her biases aren't quite right. I really, really liked this one. It's like a little bite-sized slice of everything that makes the original game so good. You got that empathy for others, quiet moments of contemplation, great action scenes, and a whole bunch of himbo. If there's anything wrong with it, it's that I really wish it was longer. It's over too dang quick, a particularly shame as this, along with the other stories here, are written by Core Screaming Show's author, and I love her style. It's also worth noting that there's technically another story I haven't talked about in this review, which is a comedy side story included only as a bonus from buying at a specific shop. Sadly, as far as I can tell, it's never been dumped online, and copies are rare as hell, though incredibly cheap when they do turn up. If anyone watching this somehow has a hold of this, please let me know because I'd love to check it out. All in all, with everything I said over the course of Oh god, nearly two hours? Yeah, uh, nearly two hours of talking, what do I ultimately think about Gunkatana? If it isn't already obvious by my sheer amount of praise for the game, despite some flaws, some minor and major, I still love this game for all that it does right. And it does a hell of a lot right. Out of all of the games I've played from Black Psych, it is by far my favorite so far just for how much it's my particular brand of bullshit. And I think it's one of a lot of universal appeal despite a few rough patches. As it stands now, I think people who enjoy games with adult content and have some tolerance for heavier content will be able to fall in love with this one as much as I did. If what I said has made you want to check it out, then you'll be pleased to know this game isn't too terribly hard to get a hold of. It's on sale on a Japanese digital storefront for 4,500 yen, though you will need to use PayPal to buy points for them as international credit cards don't work, and used copies on secondhand shops like Mandarake and auction sites like Yahoo Auctions often go for less than a thousand yen. The best way to get this game in my opinion though is with this, the Full Metal Box, a collection containing some of Black Sykes' greatest hits up until 2008. You get Gore Screaming Show, another amazing horror VN, though with a much more typical setting, Extravaganza, which I've been sold on many times as one of the best VNs of the 2000s, Mushik Sukai, an interesting early Black Psych title, and of course, Gun Katana. You even get an art book for the game inside of the Full Metal book, along with the ever-elusive Gore Screaming Show prequel comic. At around 4,000 yen used, it's one of the best deals in Japanese PC gaming, and I cannot recommend it enough. Some of the later prints branded as Windows 7 and 8 compatible do tend to go for a fair bit more money, but I've had zero compatibility issues with the copies of the games included in my original release here. Again, I really can't recommend this enough. And the same goes for Gun Katana as a whole. It's a fun, messy boomer shooter with soul and cool mechanics. It's an entertaining, silly horror game with great cheesy atmosphere that has fun with itself. And it's a captivating, frilling visual novel with an incredible story that blends some of the best of titles made for women and for men into a single wonderful mixture with a cast of characters that I mostly couldn't help but fall in love with. I think it's also interesting in a broader subcultural context these days. Boomer shooters weren't really popular in the late 2000s and early 2010s outside of their niches as far as I've been able to surmise. If you wanted new boom shoot action, you had to go find the exceedingly rare indie game or mods for your favorite title. Some of those indie games actually just being mods for your favorite title. But nowadays, they're everywhere and have been since at least 2018 when Dusk released and took the world by storm which makes Gun Katana almost like the grandma of what we know now. That alone certainly gives the title a higher chance of being localized than ever before, and I think if it did get released, it would be a damn good seller. Though as it stands, if you're an aspiring Japanese learner, the game isn't too hard to read. Bungay's prose is easy enough to parse, characters speak of a lot of common slang and speech quirks, and it works just fine with text hookers and such. Perhaps someday soon we'll see this game in English so an even wider audience can experience it, because to me, Gun Katana, even with its flaws, is a title I can strongly recommend to fans of anime and boomer shooter as THE game that manages to blend them together right, and it's something I can recommend to fans of Erage in general as a fascinating and experimental entry into the genre. Himena's journey to find her freedom is captivating from start to finish, and it deserves so much more attention than it's gotten. You 